Today, we are incredibly excited to announce our first step in this transition with our first chip designed specifically for the Mac. And we call it M1. I'm Rene Ritchie, and I'm reacting live to the Apple Silicon event, sponsored by CuriosityStream with Nebula. Apple has probably been dangling Apple Silicon like a sort of Damocles over the heads of Intel just for many, many years, trying to encourage them to keep with their roadmap. But obviously, sadly, they haven't. And now Apple is moving their industry leading, their pace setting silicon from iPhone and iPad to the Mac. And Apple's calling it M1. And the M series, they actually used that name previously for the sensor fusion hubs, the motion processors that were introduced along with the A-series and were eventually integrated into the A-series as the always-on processors, thereby freeing up this name, this pretty much perfect name for the Mac chip. And now we have Johnny Suruji, who is Senior Vice President of the Hardware Technologies Group, basically of Apple Silicon, to tell us about how the M-series differs from the A-series. And Apple's going with an SOC, a system on chip design here. And I use this analogy, it's a horrible analogy, but Think about a traditional computer with a discrete CPU and GPU and RAM and all the other controllers as like a dinner table full of computer parts, like a, a banquet, a feast, where an SOC is like a sandwich. Everything is just layered on top of each other. Not quite everything, the CPU, the GPU, the a &E, the Apple Neural Engine, um, sometimes the RAM, sometimes that's off, but a lot of the components are just in one chip and have universal memory and it gives them a lot of advantages. And the unified memory architecture, it just means there you're removing so much latency from a CPU and GPU having to communicate together. And Apple is debuting this on Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing's five nanometer process, which just means they can fit far more transistors into the same space, which means they can get the same amount of power in a smaller size or more power in a larger size. And Apple's using 16 billion transistors, which probably means they're not just filling up the entire size, they're doing a mix of both. They're mixing performance gains and efficiency gains because uh, what we've seen with Apple's architecture forever now is just that they believe you achieve performance through efficiency. And they have performance cores like in the current iPhone, the A14. Those performance cores are Firestorm on the A series and the efficiency cores are Ice Storm on the A series. No idea what they're called here. Might be the same thing if they're the same IP generation. And Apple's claiming it's the world's fastest CPU core, ultra wide, 120, sorry, 100, 192 kilobytes of instruction cache. Uh, Apple likes these big, big uh, caches and four efficiency cores. All right, so we have a design that looks so far like an X series chip where instead of having four efficiency and two performance cores, like on the A series, did I get that backwards? Two perform, no, I think that's right on the A14, this is more like what an A14X would be where you have four plus four for eight cores total. Apple says the M1 is the highest performance CPU they've ever created and comparing it to something like Intel's anemic uh, Core M series, which they misbrand now as Core, uh, that's not hard to believe, but I'm interested to see how it compares to that I series, the ones that have been in MacBook Pros recently. And Apple is, Apple is just braggadociously, they're just strutting, saying how much better performance per watt, uh, which is an important measure. You can do anything if you just add enough cores and add enough power, but it's not a realistic way. It's not a practical way. It's not a, uh, an experientially good way of increasing power. Apple's doing what they say is better performance at one quarter of the power. And Apple's claiming with M1 a three times, a massive three times improvement in performance per watt. And so what they wanna do as well is, uh, is achieve the maximum graphics performance within the thermal envelope of their products. And Apple's been facing this thing for years where Intel's just been making hotter, hotter and more powerful chips that just require more and more thermal capacity. And Apple wants to design these light portable machines, and those two things have been in conflict. But now Apple gets to purpose build all the silicon for the devices that they wanna make. And they have an eight core GPU here as well. Again, very similar to what you get in an X series chip, actually the Z series chip now. The last X series chip, the A12X only had seven cores because of yield issues, but the A12Z had all eight cores. So, so far it looks very much like an iPad Pro architecture or iPad Pro style chip. And again, they're claiming massive GPU improvements over the current generation of laptop chips. 
and again achieving the same peak performance as a PC chip at one third the power. And they're claiming it's the world's fastest integrated graphics. So compared to something like Intel's Iris Pro series. Like I, I think we're in sort of a post GPU, post CPU era where a lot of the interesting things in silicon are happening in the other IP blocks. Apple's got the ANE, the Apple Neural Engine. They've got the 16 core Apple Neural Engine, same as the A14 chip. But there's also a bunch of different controllers and accelerators. Uh, they've got the secure enclave in here. Basically, Apple tries to think about anything that they want to have being high performance on the chip, whether that's you know crunching HEVC video or making sure that disk reads and writes are really fast but really reliable. They just build custom silicon to do it. Same thing, the ISP, the image signal processor, which is really important on iPhones, a little bit less so on iPads because you're not taking as many photos probably even a little bit less important on a Mac because you'll be taking even less photos still. But for things like web calls, it'll, you know, if they match it with good glass, hopefully that'll enable a better generation of Apple webcams. And we're back to John Turnus. And the really cool thing about this is when you're dealing with a merchant silicon provider like an Intel or even like an AMD or a Qualcomm, they're making a chip that applies to everybody, that has to work with everybody's hardware, that has to carry the load, like it has to carry DirectX for Windows and OpenGL for other platforms. And it's not purpose built for what you want. And the advantage Apple has always, always had with the iPhone or iPad is they could purpose build all of the silicon for exactly the hardware and software that they were making, the hardware and software feature sets that they were planning to build. So there's just zero overhead and not having to settle for anything. And that's sort of the secret sauce now they're bringing to the, to the Apple Silicon Mac, the M1 Mac. And so we have the app launching acceleration. We have the Safari acceleration, which we saw with the A14 in the iPhone and iPad. It's just runs JavaScript like nothing else in the industry. Apple's claiming 1.9 times more responsive, but just the marks, the benchmarks that we've seen on it are ridiculous. And of course, it's got all the animation that's driven by everything from the metal layer all the way down to that silicon level. And Craig is claiming super fast rendering for 3D animations, for videos. And that's what he's saying that is due to the unified memory architecture, where again, not RAM on the CPU and video memory on the GPU, and they have to talk to each other and that introduces both separate memories that, you know, they can't use the entire sum total of memory, but also the latency of talking in between them. And here we have DaVinci Resolve, which is not Final Cut Pro, so interesting that they're showing us that, but just showing how well that sort of a memory architecture can work in these sorts of situations. And we also have the power management, the kind that we're used to on iOS and Mac OS that allows for battery life that is design battery life that is intentionally and software accelerated to be better than the physical size of the battery would ever allow on its own. And of course, every silicon nerd in the universe is looking at Craig's desk and trying to identify exactly what those boards do. Now we're getting hardware verified secure boot, automatic high performance encryption, Mac OS runtime protections. So pretty much all the security benefits that you get in an iOS environment, you're getting in a Mac OS environment as well, which is really good news for casual users, people who really want to be protected uh, and want uh, sort of a managed experience. We'll see what they allow for more hobbyist pro users. So far, it sounds like you'll be able to disable all this uh, if you want to, but for people who don't care about any of that, it will provide a better experience. And of course, all of Apple's apps from things like just the built-in apps, the productivity apps, to GarageBand and iMovie, to Logic Pro and Final Cut Pro, all of those have been optimized. I think he just said six times faster in Final Cut Pro. And again, that's what you get when you can integrate directly with the silicon and build the IP blocks to directly accelerate exactly the tasks you want to do. And the software story here is in three parts. We have universal apps where developers will be able to make apps for Intel Macs and M1, Apple Silicon Macs at the same time. They'll have the binary, the bits for both of those. And then at download time, the app store, the Mac app store will just determine which version of the machine you have, the Intel or the M1, and give you the appropriate version of that app. But for the developer, it's one deployment and it lets them have the app on both platforms. And then for apps that don't have the universal binary, there is Rosetta 2, named after the original Rosetta from the Power PC to Intel transition. And this is the emulation layer. This means that for apps that have not been ported over, that have not been rewritten or retargeted to Apple Silicon, 
Intel apps, basically, they'll be able to run through this emulation layer on the Mac, and they're going to be accelerated through things like um, Metal. And I'm sure Apple's got just all the custom silicon blocks in there to make that experience run faster than it has any right to. And of course, they're also going to allow iOS and iPad apps on the Mac, which I guess is the modern equivalent of allowing Windows apps on the Mac. Back, the, back when Apple moved to Intel, one of the benefits was uh, Intel being on x86 so that you could either run VM, virtual machines, or you could run boot camp and just run Windows apps. But now, you know, instead of Microsoft Office, half of the people are on Google Docs and a lot of stuff just runs in web browsers, be it Safari or Chrome or Firefox. But also for a lot of people being able to run their iOS apps, their iPad apps could be more compelling today. I'm talking about mainstream people could be more compelling today than the ability to run Windows apps. I mean, I don't want to say Candy Crush, if they do it, would be the most popular game on Mac OS overnight. But as, as weird as that sounds for professionals, that's probably what a lot of mainstream customers are going to want and want to try immediately. And they're talking up about how the future they dream of is a seamless workflow between your iPhone, your iPad, and your Mac, where you just have instances of all these apps, of all of your apps, and your work just follows you, just moves with you from desktop to handheld to pocketable, and you can do everything you need to do on whatever device you need to do it on, whenever and wherever you need to do it. And that's sort of the beautiful dream, and it's often been cloud-based with like thin clients, but Apple's doing real edge computing here where it can be cloud-based, but you're also getting some of the most performant hardware in the world, allowing you to leverage all of that local power from the silicon through the operating system, native apps, all of that to just make that workflow so much less frustrating, theoretically, so much less frustrating and so much better in terms of user experience. And also side guess that Apple announced the M1 before the A14X so they could say the M1 is the most powerful chip they've ever created and not as powerful as the A14X if they had announced an iPad Pro earlier or were announcing it at the same time because that's a really nice sort of message to wrap the Apple Silicon launch around and the M1 launch around. And yeah, it ain't over, folks. I've got a ton more videos coming your way. And for even more content, check out CuriosityStream, now with Nebula. Nebula is a streaming video service I started with my education creator friends like Legal Eagle, Thomas Frank, Vanessa Hill, Sof's Notes, Polymatter, and many, many more. It's a place where none of us have to worry about demonetization or the tyranny of click-through rates or watch time or the algorithm or ads. And you can find all of my videos there completely ad-free including Apple Talk, the new podcast I'm hosting with Georgia Dow, where technology meets psychology. And we talk about how all of these companies are affecting our culture and our lives. And every episode, every episode has a bonus topic available exclusively on Nebula. So what does this all have to do with CuriosityStream? Well, they're the go-to source for the best documentaries on the internet, and they love educational content and creators. And we worked out this deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream with the link in the description, not only do you get CuriosityStream, but you also get a Nebula subscription for free. And for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering 26% all of their annual plans. And yeah, 26% is just the best deal you'll find anywhere. So click the link in the description or go to crossfitstream.com slash Renee Ritchie. It's a great way to support this channel and educational content directly for just $14.79 per year. Just go to the link in the description or go to crossfitstream.com slash Renee Ritchie. And clicking on that link really helps out this channel. For a ton more on everything Apple is announcing today, check out the playlist above. I'm going to go through every spec, every feature, every pro and every con and more. Just click the link in the playlist and see you next video.